right precaution. I appreciate the fact that you guys have taken out time to uh, attend the series. I'd like to welcome you to the iCurate webinar specials, the CXO series. Uh, I have the privilege today of introducing Rajat Sethuraman, who is the CEO of Latent View Analytics, who will be joining us. I just request all of you to just go and mute, please. Thank you. Rajiv is going to be talking to us today about how to turn AI into ROI, strategies to drive value and transformation for clients. The session will be moderated by Sami Dhanujani, the CEO of AI Curate Advisory and Consulting. Just before we start, a few housekeeping issues. Um, I still have a few people who are not on mute. I request you to go on mute. It uh, actually disturbs both the speakers as well as the audience. Question to comply. We'll also be taking questions uh, towards the end of the session. We'll be taking out 10 to 15 minutes for the same. I request you to use the chat and the QA panel that you have to post your questions and I'll forward them to Samir. I'm sorry, we still have people uh, not on mute. All right, thank you. I'm going to start with the introduction of Rajan. Rajan Sethuraman is the CEO of Latent View Analytics, a trusted analytics partner to the world's most recognized brands. Rajan has over 20 years of consulting experience in business strategy, supply chain management, analytics, operational improvement, and talent management, working with the strategy management consulting practices of Accenture and KPMG. Rajan has worked with several Indian and multinational organizations in the oil and gas and metals and mining sectors on a broad spectrum of strategic and operational initiatives. Post his management consulting career, Rajan led talent acquisition for Accenture's global delivery network for technology in India. He was also the HR analytics lead responsible for the adoption of the scientific approach to HR process improvement based on data and analytics. He was subsequently the global L&D lead for Accenture's infrastructure business, helping build new age digital skills around cloud, mobility, and cybersecurity. Rajan holds a bachelor's in engineering from Bix Pilani, and is a postgraduate diploma in management from IIN Calcutta. Rajan, it's a privilege. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand it over to Samir now. Samir, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Rohan, and welcome, Rajan. It's an uh, honor to have you on this uh, webinar session. I know you are easy to catch in, in terms of uh, talk, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's a privilege to have you on our webinar session. Uh, I think uh, I, I just want to first, uh, and Rajan, uh, it's something which I always had this intrigue about you. Accenture, KPMG, and uh, you've done multiple consulting assignments have uh, interacted with several, I would say, uh, global Indian clients. From a consulting viewpoint, and I'm just trying to deep dive into your professional uh, arena, from a consulting point of view, what is that you've seen which has changed over the years? Okay, it's a, it's a great question to kick this off. Before I touch upon uh, What's changed over the years? Uh, maybe I should talk about what hasn't changed uh, because uh, some things uh, stay the same. And I'm sure that many of us are noticing that uh, as we are exper experiencing uh, the current scenario that's playing out, right, in terms of what continues to stay the same as well. Uh, human connections and collaborations are of paramount importance, right, in the scenario. I'm sure that uh, that's what everybody is experiencing uh, in their uh, personal and professional lives today. Consulting, uh, I have always, uh, uh, looked at it uh, more as the art of asking the right questions. Uh, there are umpteen jokes about it. I mean, that people might have heard about that consultant is somebody who takes your watch, uh, tells you the time, and then charges you for the for, for it. Uh, but jokes apart, I think uh, uh, one thing that I have noticed uh, has stayed uh, constant in terms of a consulting approach and methodology is really uh, in terms of uh, delving into complex situations, uncertain situations, and then asking the right questions so that you can uh, you can deconstruct the problem, right? You can peel the onion and then get to 
what matters the most. So I think that is uh, something that uh, that continues uh, even even today, right? In in spite of all the changes that one sees in the business world, uh, in the socio economic sphere as well, uh, the ability to actually uh, get into complex situations and then deconstruct them. I think that is at the heart of consulting, right? And and that can be true of consulting in, in any particular area. Now, what is changing? Uh, of course, as you deconstruct it uh, uh, today, the options that are available and the choices uh, that are there for people to solve different parts of the problem, they are plentiful, right? It is not uh, uh, like earlier where uh, there were certain uh, approaches or methodologies or there were certain kinds of uh, constructs that you could use in order to tackle a problem. Today, the options are plentiful. I mean, the same problem can be uh, solved using a variety of uh, approaches and techniques. And uh, today, everybody is talking about analytics and artificial intelligence as a as a very important way and approach of solving those problems. I remember uh, way back uh, in 1995 when I started my career with Accenture, one of the very first projects that I did was uh, for this uh, security printing press uh, in, in Vidarbha, in Nagpur. Uh, they were printing uh, check leaves and uh, share certificates and so on. Basically, what are considered as secure instruments, right? That can be that are taken as legal tender. And the whole project was uh, about reducing the cost base of their operations so that they are becoming more profitable. Now, we did a ton of data analysis in that, but most of that was done not even using Excel. I mean, you may not believe me, but uh, we actually sat and worked with pen and paper. I mean, the, the first time I got a laptop was only in uh, in 98 or so okay 98 99 before that we had to book time in the desktop in the offices in case we wanted to create a powerpoint deck or uh, even do some complex computations so what was done using pen and paper the approach and methodology uh, the fundamentals might still remain the same but today you have more techniques there is more data that is available there are uh, more options for you to analyze the data in order to get to the right answers for the component parts of the problem so i would say that Consulting art remains the same, but the instruments that you have in order to paint the picture uh, or to deconstruct the problem, that has become numerous and plentiful. That, that, that'll be my take. Great, great. No, I, I think it's fascinating to know what you said. And while it's a different thing, you talked about Nagpur. One of the example I talk about Nagpur uh, being a topical theme, uh, it's, it's known for oranges, everyone. Uh, is aware about that but uh, with the soil density kind of getting changed because of you know the global warming and other variables a uh, lot of that data has been used over the years just to analyze and uh, farmers have been now told based on the data and exploration of insights which have happened that oranges may not be the right crop for Nagpur so I think just just an anecdote kind of a thing what you mentioned uh, so you, you talked about this whole consulting thing about asking the right questions and also the ability to kind of look at solving the complex, unresolved and large problems. But the fact over there, Rajan, as, as you see today, AI, with the advent, and you rightly said, the sophistication of machines, tools, techniques, uh, everything is available. It's off the shelf. Are we seeing, and this is uh, you uh, who interacts with a lot of clients, interface with a lot of external, I would say, environment. Are you seeing large, complex, unresolved problems getting solved by AI from a client perspective, or is it still at an infancy? I mean, I, I would say that uh, uh, early stages in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the the proliferation of the of the tools and. Uh, uh, the point solutions that are available. I mean, I think uh, uh, just to use uh, current terminology, uh, we are still in that exponential growth phase uh, in terms of just uh, figuring out uh, the number of options and the tools and the and the solutions that are available. I mean, so today, when you look around for uh, most problems, right, point sol point problems, meaning well defined problems, uh, there are a, a whole lot of uh, uh, approaches uh, that are available. Uh, when I say approaches, I'm talking about products and solutions and, and off the shelf uh, uh, mechanisms that might be there right, for people to use. Uh, so that is still in the exponential growth phase. Uh, just as in the world of, uh, uh, say, ERP, right, uh, uh, the way it unfolded uh, 15, 20 years back, uh, 
uh, everybody used to uh, think about building a custom solution in those days, right, for, for their unique challenges and problems. And then came the world of uh, ERP solutions. We had SAP and Oracle, right, and Bon and Triton. And I mean, there's so many of them are in those days, right? And everybody was uh, talking about which solution is the right solution for our context and what we are trying to do. Uh, today, many organizations, when it comes to uh, AI and, uh, and analytic solutions, I think they are in that kind of a phase because you find so many options in front of you, both in terms of products and solutions, uh, as well as uh, service providers even. Uh, and therefore, often uh, it is confusing on whether I should just go and pick one of them in order to apply to my context and situation, or am I better off uh, building something that is uh, very specific and uh, unique to my requirements. So I think we are at, we are at that phase in terms of the evolution. Uh, but as with uh, ERP, I think uh, we will follow that path because as more and more uh, data is available about the problem and we have better ways of deconstructing the problem, as I talked about, uh, it gives you greater clarity in terms of what approaches are uh, applicable and which of them might be the suited. So the solutions, and the services stack on top of the solutions will evolve so that uh, you're able to address very unique requirements of organizations uh, using broad spectrum solutions even, right? That's how ERPs have evolved. I mean, today, uh, you, the best of ERP solutions, they are able to address a range of contexts you know, from industry to industry and within industry from company to company with their nuances and differences and so on. I think we are still some distance, quite some distance uh, uh, from uh, from that point and uh, for that point, uh, when you try and look at what is happening in the AI world, I mean today you have a lot of point solutions, you have a lot of niche players who attack specific uh, problems, uh, but many of them work as uh, stacks on top of uh, broader spectrum solutions that are available, you know, the transaction and operational systems. So there is some distance to go, but I think uh, the direction is going to be that. I mean we're going to we're going to be finding more and more of uh, artificial intelligence solutions being able to address broad spectrum problems, uh, especially uh, using a combination of what is possible within the construct of the product, but also uh, the kind of services that can be provided on top of it. And, and uh, in, in, in many ways, you know, uh, uh, going back to what we talked about in consulting and problem solving, uh, problems requires that flexibility where you are not just bound by what is uh, defined within the particular uh, uh, solution or approach that you're using, but be able to flex so that now we're able to incorporate the nuances that might be playing out in the context. So I think that's really what uh, most uh, companies will be looking for. And I'm sure that therefore the evolution will progress in that fashion. So you, you made some interesting point, Rajan, and I just want to deep uh, dive into further, I mean, further into this the landscaping view of uh, AI consulting providers, your player players, uh, then on top of that, we have service provider, niche boutique firms, uh, startups, and even uh, then there is an in-house which is being done in the GCC. So it's a very wide spectrum actually. And as, as it happens, if something like AI, which is the most talked about lexicon and the business uh, side of the CXOs, it becomes much more, I would say complex for one, existing clients and potential clients to really say, look, where are those kind of, let's say, kind of uh, signals we should be kind of picking up in terms of one, selecting the right pen. Second, really looking at off the shelf approach in terms of creating or rather picking up a solution or let's say getting it packaged in form of a consulting list. So you've been aggregating a lot of these customer feedbacks and been, uh, I would say, in front of these customers. What is that you are hearing and what is your view in terms of this landscape of AI today and what you foresee in the future, I mean, how the whole, whole situation will look like? Got it. Uh, and and uh, I will try and uh, illustrate the challenges uh, by talking about uh, uh, complexity at uh, two ends of the spectrum, right? Uh, complexity uh, is what drives people to uh, pursue more sophisticated approaches, meaning that if a problem were very simple, then uh, you can actually use fairly uh, simple mechanisms to address that problem as well, right? Uh, but the, the moment a, comp a problem becomes more complex, then you need more sophisticated approaches. Now, what do I mean by a complex problem? A complex problem can be a, a 
complex because of uh, two reasons, okay? At, and these are the two ends of the spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you could be having complexity that arises because of the extreme nuanced nature of what we are trying to address, right? Uh, and, and an example of that would be like, uh, how do you uh, figure out, uh, say, fraudulent transactions uh, in, a, in an e-commerce uh, scenario where uh, you are trying to uh, bring together uh, buyers and sellers, right, on a platform, and uh, you are trying to uh, figure out uh, what kind of signals can be picked up uh, prior to even the transaction getting executed or as part of the transaction's execution on uh, whether that transaction is looking right or not. And and you and and, and uh, e-commerce companies and uh, uh, say uh, financial service providers, fintech companies face these challenges. Uh, uh, very often, right, in their business. And, and each of their situations could be very nuanced and very specific because of the, the way they have defined their problems, who they are bringing together, the aggregator role that they are functioning, and therefore the complexities of their situation, right? So that's one type of complexity. The other complexity that I talk about is complexity that uh, arises not because of the nuanced nature of a specific point problem, but complexity because of the interaction of multiple moving parts. If you're trying to figure out what is the approach that you take to enhance the marketing return on investment, for example, of an organization, right? And marketing is, it's a, it's a fairly uh, uh, a complex function, right? In terms of the number of uh, decisions that you need to make, how those decisions are interrelated with all the other parts of the organization from a sales, from a finance perspective, from a supply chain perspective. And, uh, you are now trying to figure out and fit in data from multiple areas in order to under, you know, understand and uh, and uh, remedy you know remedy a situation that might be there. So the complexity, the other kind of complexity, is the one that arises because of uh, just the size, the sheer size, and the multiple moving parts that are there. Uh, in, so in I'll just chime in, uh, Rajan. You you gave a very interesting perspective: the complexity, decision making, and insights, and often. Uh, we've heard the scenario, hey, you guys, guys have been doing this thing for years. The concept of the problem, whether it's marketing, HR, sales, uh, or let's say uh, supply chain remains the same. Why seemingly the whole aspect of decision making using AI tools and techniques becomes difficult. And instead of being kind of a rinse and repeat situation, it's like going through the origination of the problem again and so is there a way what, what I'm trying to lead to from your perspective is there a way through which this can be accelerated it can be uh, it can be accelerated but uh, let me maybe touch upon why uh, there is uh, this approach of uh, trying to figure out uh, a new solution to that problem i mean sometimes people might even uh, ask why are you reinventing the wheel i mean uh, these problems have existed in the past and uh, there are approaches that we have used in the past. So why are we trying to, uh, why, why are we not just doing the rinse and repeat, as you said, right? And, and why are we trying to do that? I think uh, uh, in most instances, uh, the reason that uh, AI and data and analytics uh, are really uh, seeming as interesting uh, idea to consider at this point in time is because of uh, the complexity of uh, the problems that we were trying to solve is becoming more and more clearer as we peel the layers of the onion and then we understand that there is a lot more intricacy to what we used to see in the past, okay? Uh, I sometimes use this example of uh, the mathematical, uh, the fractals, right? I mean, you would have heard about fractals in the Mandelbrot set. Uh, uh, fractals got a very interesting property. I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's actually a bounded uh, figure or a construct uh, Therefore, with a finite area, right? I mean, so if you take a rectangle or a square, a rectangle square or a circle, I mean, the area is bounded, but the perimeter is also defined, right? The fractal has a property that uh, the perimeter can be infinite, even though the area contained within the perimeter is very finite, okay? So fractals are used for modeling uh, coastlines, for example, right? Fractals are used for modeling uh, very complex uh, uh, situations like uh, uh, how stock markets uh, behave. Now, the reason I give the fractal as an example is because uh, if you uh, if you actually zoom into a fractal uh, figure, uh, you will actually see that the complexities keep increasing with every level of uh, zoom, right? Uh, 
uh, people might have also experienced this uh, powers of 10 video, right? That's there available on the internet. I mean, if, if somebody hasn't seen it, I think it's a good thing to go and take a look. Just go and type powers of 10 on uh, Google and you'll find it. Uh, this actually uh, explores starting from uh, human vision, right? Uh, in terms of the magnification that we are familiar with. Uh, and then it uh, on the one end, it goes all the way to the cosmic scale, right? I mean, in terms of how large the universe and therefore powers of 10, right? Going from what you see as your room, your community, your country, the world map, right? And then the uh, the Milky Way, I mean, the, the solar system, Milky Way and so on. At the other end of the spectrum, it delves deeper and deeper into uh, you know, into uh, uh, an atom and, and within the atom, the nucleus, within the nucleus, an electron or a proton. And then you see that as you peel the onion, then you delve deeper and deeper, more and more intricacy is revealed, more and more order is revealed. Uh, but that order can be understood only if you are willing to delve into those levels of depth and then really understand those intricacies. Today, what is happening in, in the AI space because of the availability of data is exactly that. What we thought was fairly a simple situation with just a few variables governing the behavior of people, functions, systems, and processes. We are now uncovering that there is a lot more complexity involved in that. I mean, uh, uh, eight years back, uh, when uh, we were setting up the HR analytics team in Accenture, uh, we were actually uh, trying to model uh, attrition and reneg. Reneg was a big problem, meaning somebody accepts an offer but doesn't turn up on the day of. It's still a problem, I guess. <laughs> it's still a problem, yeah, exactly. We were trying to model uh, uh, reneg. You now, how can you predict whether a person is likely to join you or will not turn up on the date of joining? So, uh, what is happening then was that uh, we started off with a very few simple uh, variables. We said that, okay, maybe these are the five things or 10 things that will determine. Like things like compensation, are we able to give the person the type of designation or title that they are looking for? Are we giving them a job in a city of their liking or their home city, right? Few things like that. Is, is the comp increase uh, adequate and so on? But believe me, right, when we started diving into the problem, we then came up with 50 different variables, okay, that can matter. Uh, today, people don't just rest with those 50. Those 50 are constructs or variables that have uh, a clear meaning in the physical world. Today, people do feature engineering. I mean, I'm sure that everybody would have heard about feature engineering. And feature engineering uses mathematical, uh, they are all pure mathematical constructs, right? Where you take two different variables and then you combine them in very interesting ways in order to come up with a new dimension or a variable, hoping that that dimension will add more orthogonality to the problem that you're solving. So ideally in any problem, what you want to do is you want to come up with all the dimensions that are orthogonal to one another, which means that they are not dependent on one another, meaning they're all independent dimensions that determine what the context is and therefore what should be the right solution. Today we see a proliferation of those orthogonal dimensions, both real as well as, well as mathematical because of the amount of data that is available. So therefore in some sense, the beauty of the complexity is revealed as we delve deeper and deeper, right? As we peel the onion. And I think that is the reason why AI and analytics has this kind of an appeal today, because today we are looking at data sets and we are looking at uh, dimensions that we didn't think about before. And therefore there will be a greater and greater amount of interest in uncovering all of those dimensions and then using the right mathematical and technical constructs to solve those problems. Great, great. Now, I think in a way you largely really put up, I mean, I would say had you put out a construct, which is seemingly what I think is the need of the R uh, complexity apart. It's all about making sense. And as you rightly said, it's about decision making within the corporates, which needs to come out when a desired kind of an AI or analytics tool technique or solution is deployed. I, I think Switching gears, right? uh, there's a lot, uh, I think, which is happening today now, just kind of changing the track. A lot of clients, a lot of enterprises have gone through a journey of what I say, of really crafting their 2020 plan and suddenly then retracting and really got into this mode, what I say, uh, incognito mode today where they don't know how it's leading the whole scenario into. And digital transformation has been into the forefront. And within that, AI has been absolutely very, very integral part. Now, having said that, strategically, plans, 
drafted, put in place, and seemingly now, in a couple of months, we are looking at situations where these plans will go for a change. Now, from a viewpoint, you you work with a lot of customers, you have a lot of these global Indian clients. What is that you are hearing? Are there more headwinds or tailwinds, or you believe this is just an interim phase and we would get into more of a strategic continuation once this post recovery happens? Just want to take your views on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is definitely going to be. Uh... A significant amount of uh, disruption in the short term. I think everybody is uh, uh, is becoming more and more uh, clear about that as this scenario is uh, playing out. Uh, I think there is also a uh, uh, realization and acceptance that uh, there will be a new normal after all of this stuff, right? And, and things are not going to be the, the same as, as it was before uh, in several walks of uh, life and business. So I think uh, that acceptance is, uh, is dawning on people the more most of the articles that I uh, read and, and, and the conversations that I'm having, uh, they indicate that uh, the world is going to be like a, a fairly different place, right? When it comes to uh, 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 how we conduct our lives and how we conduct our business and so on. Now, the challenge, of course, is uh, uh, predicting or uh, figuring out what is going to stay the same and uh, what is going to change dramatically so that the actions that one can take in the interim, in the short term, uh, that you're doing the right things, you know, that you're not uh, running at uh, breakneck speed in the opposite direction, right? We don't want to do that. We want to be like staying close to the context and then uh, while there is a lot of fuzziness, at least try and stay close and aligned, right? The direction in which things are moving. I think that's what uh, most people are trying to figure out. Of course, there are several uh, predictions in terms of the demand shocks that will happen, the supply shocks that will happen and therefore uh, the kind of uh, responses that uh, people could take it. I don't want to get into the industry specific nuances uh, in, in this conversation today. I'm sure that you're all getting uh, enough of uh, input on which industries are going to do well, which other industries might suffer in the short term, but might pick up in the long term, right? I mean, there is a lot of stuff being, uh, being said about that. Uh, what I will touch upon more though is what is an approach that one can take? What is a philosophy that uh, one can adapt, uh, right? In, in these kind of uh, circumstances, I think, uh, what is uh, very important and what is very clear though uh, immediate from an immediate perspective is to take stock of uh, the situation uh, and understanding uh, the different dimensions that are getting impacted okay now in the current scenario means what have we seen already in terms of our business uh, in terms of uh, our industry in terms of our geography for example i mean these are all questions that people can ask saying that do i have a clear handle on what has even happened in the last one and a half months, for example, or, or three months, right, since this thing started getting bigger? Do I understand it reasonably well for me to say that, okay, I know what it is looking like right now and what has happened in the past? Because only if you understand that well, you are able to then make some predictions and projections about what is likely to unfold in the future. So I think understanding uh, the look back analytics, you know, as we talk about it, I think that becomes very important. And again, I see uh, you know, different kinds of uh, uh, people commenting on that, providing input, right, and analysis. We are we are doing the same thing. I mean, even with our clients, for example, a lot of the work that we do is really around understanding uh, what is unfolding right now, right? Do I know what changes uh, my business is experiencing, my industry is experiencing in the last uh, two months or three months? And so that's one, right one point, mm -hmm. rightly you said. But what's compounding, or rather, I would say, aggregating, uh, aggravating the situation is this whole piece around fog. There's so much of ambiguity. Seemingly, the data points are missing. Uh, the fast forward or the future forward kind of, let's say, scenario is completely ambiguous. Whatever specific agenda, what AI was supposed to drive, seems to be a bit, I would say, in a mark mode. Is that something what you also hear? And if that's a scenario, what in a situation like this client should be doing? So I think uh, the uh, real long-term uh, expectations, uh, there aren't any significant changes. So for example, uh, uh, enhancing customer life cycle value, right? Uh, or uh, uh, even employee life cycle value, right? I mean, if these are, are 
or marketing return on investment is something that we talked about. If these are important objectives for an organization, they will continue to remain important objectives uh, uh, for the uh, for the organization, right? Even uh, in the uh, uh, in, in in the in the long term. So when I say long term, I'm talking about any period like that's greater than a year or two years, okay? because everything else is like these days considered medium term, short, short term. I don't think there will be any big changes uh, on that front in terms of the uh, the value uh, creation principles that you might be using right for a business i think uh, and therefore directing any uh, efforts from an analytics perspective or from an artificial intelligence perspective and solving those long term problems they will continue to be there uh, i think what most people are trying to uh, grapple with is like what do, what happens for me in this quarter what happens for me in this year right and uh, is there going to be some substantial a uh, uh, set of different tactical operational decisions that I need to take. I mean, so one of the pieces of analysis that uh, we have been helping with, uh, helping our clients with is like what this going dark analysis. This going dark analysis is about like uh, today, uh, it doesn't make sense for you to advertise on uh, billboards, right? Uh, or does it make sense for you to advertise on the TV, right? Or should you be focusing all of your advertising on Google and Facebook, for example? Even Google and Facebook is uh, experiencing a big, big dip in their in their advertising uh, volumes and revenues because uh, clients don't want to see their ads being placed next to a, a gloomy piece of news, for example, right? That talks about mm -hmm. the number of infections or death in a particular. Day. You don't want to see an ad for a, a product, right? Which is a lifestyle or a luxury product next to that, right? So those kind of nuances are cropping up. So today you want to make decisions around the here and now and the operational things that you need to take care of. Uh, so therefore, I think much of the confusion is about how do I use uh, AI or analytics or whatever resource I might have, because companies are limited in terms of the uh, the data science and analytics firepower that they have, right? In terms of their teams, the vendors and partners that they are working with, and they will also be constrained by budget because everybody wants to conserve cash. They want to make sure that they're not spending money on speculative and discretionary stuff. So they want to spend money on the ones that generate the most amount of returns here and now, right? In this quarter, in this in this uh, year, not something that is going to help me solve the long-term customer lifecycle value question that I'm after, right? That's kind of many holy grails out there. They will happen, but how do I use AI and analytics to solve my immediate questions? Supply demand situations, right? Supply chain, for example, there are going to be plenty of products where there was a pull forward in demand. So everybody knows about the toilet paper story, right? So probably uh, so much of demand was there for toilet paper, but when we come out of the scenario, maybe people won't buy toilet paper for the next three years so because they have enough toilet paper at home, right? So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm using toilet paper as an example because everybody's read about this, but there will be so many products like that, right? Uh, could be even uh, uh, disinfectants and uh, sanitizers and so yes. you might have stocked up on those things, right? And you really don't need, so the question is, how is demand supply going to play out in those scenarios? How is price elasticity going to play out in those scenarios? So you want to use analytics and AI to solve those kind of problems, right? And, and you need to actually therefore say that, you know what? I understand that these are the dimensions and variables which really matter to me in the next quarter, because in the next quarter, I need to show results. I need to show uh, uh, that I'm able to run the company, right? Without dipping into my cash reserves. And uh, those kind of, Questions become urgent and important, right? In the current context, so I think that is where the focus will be. So, uh, I think you you mentioned the right thing. I think there are areas, and these are uh, I would say not only soft but very very meaningful areas where analytics AI could actually become a Trojan horse in terms of really finding those insights. But as a result, in what comes in Trojan, and this is a question even I asked in my previous webinar. Are we talking about a phase today where the measurement of ROI will go through a solid change in terms of how AI projects, engagements, and consulting assignments are measured? Any calibrations will be kind of foreseen in terms of something which is more structured, standardized, or you believe there'll be altogether a different, I would say, strategic view on which clients will start evaluating AI ROI. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, now back to our theme, actually. So. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's a great question because uh, this is something that uh, I have seen played out uh, uh, in the different consulting engagements that have been part of right in my earlier life. Uh, there, uh, there are phases that industries 
uh, go through. Uh, it is very well uh, demonstrated by an industry like oil and gas or metals and mining because you have a face of the industry where you do what is called uh, uh, monetizing the asset. Okay, monetizing the asset means that you have a mine or you have uh, 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 an oil well and uh, there are oil reserves or there is ore deposit right underneath the ground and uh, you have constructed your drills and uh, and your oil wells and uh, your mine pit is ready and your underground shafts are all done and then all you're focusing on is extracting as much of that resource as possible and converting it into money so monetizing the asset that you have right there's a phase like that that goes on and when you are in the monetizing the asset phase uh, you are really focused on extracting as much as you can, right? Uh, and you want to generate cash, you want to generate cash flow, and then therefore uh, you have a growth mindset, you have more long-term view, you're looking at what do I take, what do I do with that cash that I'm generating? What new acquisitions can I make? Can I build some long-term capabilities? Can I go and buy a couple of uh, mines in, in, in Africa or in some other place, right, which uh, uh, is going to give me returns much later? So there is that kind of a phase. And then there's the other phase where you need to do what is called assetizing the money, right? The assetizing the money part is like where I have the money, right? But uh, now my ore body is getting depleted, right? Uh, my oil well reserves are smaller. Now it is more expensive for me to extract that resource. So therefore, operational pressures and cost reduction pressures and belt tightening pressures come to the floor. Uh, and, and that is another phase. I think today, the entire world, pretty much all the industries, barring maybe a very few, uh, they are in the second kind of a phase because they need to look at how do I tighten the belt? How do I control my costs? How do I make sure that everything that I'm doing is generating some returns in the short term for me, in the medium term for me, so that I'm conserving cash and I'm doing the right things. So much of that uh, uh, focus, uh, even though it may not be uh, uh, the, the right thing to do, I'm guessing that much of it is going to swerve towards that. So uh, what could have been uh, one foot in today, one foot in tomorrow kind of a strategy uh, will instead change to let's jump in with both feet into the current context and then solve the problems that we need to solve today, then worry about tomorrow later. Uh, now, I think companies uh, that continue to keep that one foot in today and one foot in tomorrow will emerge uh, victorious in the longer term, right? But it will take a lot of hard thinking and uh, decisions for you to continue to be able to do that, okay? And that will depend on what is the health of the company already, how well uh, uh, funded they are, right? How, what is the, I mean, and, and this is a spectrum of companies that you're talking about, whether it's small companies, startups, or uh, medium sized businesses, or very large businesses. Even a company like Exxon Mobil today, for example, right? Uh, because of uh, what is happening in the external world with respect to the oil, uh, oil prices, I'm sure that they will be thinking about how do we conserve cash in this scenario, right? And then not go ahead and then, uh, make some crazy uh, investments, right, in, in acquisitions or, or even in projects. So many projects, I believe, are going to be focused on the here and now. It may not be the right thing to do, but I think that's the reality that we have to face. What consulting partners and strategic advisors can help with uh, is to show the mirror and, and say that uh, uh, this is important. I understand and this is urgent, but you also need to do the Q2 thinking, the quadrant two thinking as Franklin Covey talks about, right, that you just don't focus on the urgent, but you also focus on the important. The important may not play out for you in the next three months, but it is going to play out for you in the next three years. So will you emerge victorious coming out of this, uh, you know, this scenario that you're saying? So I think uh, uh, that reorientation is necessary uh, and, and that orientation will be towards the kind of things that I talk about. Is my business model changing completely? Uh, am I going to be going more digital in comparison to the extent of digital operations that I have today? Is my... Uh, a work model in terms of where I manufacture and how I manufacture, is that going to change dramatically? I mean, everybody is talking about uh, that there is going to be a, a, a two big forces at play. One is automation, of course, where a lot of things that are done by uh, humans and people today might get automated because the reliance on human capacity and the shocks that can result and because of that reliance uh, might be very, uh, might be uh, 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 seen in much stark way because of the crisis that because if, if your plants are somewhere uh, in China or in uh, Southeast Asia and uh, your supply chain is impacted, no, not because of all the travel embargoes and, and uh, the kind of uh, challenges that are going to be put in place, uh, even if you have capacity there, you cannot get the product and your widgets out into the market. 
So those kind of challenges are going to be. So there are going to be forces around automation. There's going to be forces around uh, uh, nationalization as well, right? Uh, meaning that can we be in greater control of what we are producing and, and where we are selling? So these kind of forces are going to play out. So it'd be important to use uh, data and analytics to study uh, shocks that the world economy has experienced in the past. Uh, and we have examples starting right from, I don't know, 1900. I mean, everybody talks about the Spanish flu ep epidemic, for example, right? and, and there are data sets emerging from that epidemic, right, in terms of how the world handled it and how the economy moved. World War II's, uh, World Wars that we have been through, I mean, every, Great Depression, I mean, there are a lot of data points. The question is, can we use all of that to study and model how things like, are likely to change? And can we use those insights to determine our focus? I agree that there needs to be focus on the here and now and the quarter, but how do we make sure that we are also playing out for the long term? So I think you rightly mentioned something and a lot of insights you threw into this particular response, Rajan. And I was talking to one of the hedge friend, uh, fund uh, person uh, and he said that, look, maybe this would be the time which will enable a lot of AI consulting, AI uh, pure play providers to work on remodeling the whole scenarios for different spectrum of companies because the models per se need, for go, need to go for a change. The variables, the assumption and the whole aspect of what should be now seen as the new normal, you rightly said, needs a change. And maybe that's something which will compel organization to say, look, we need more kind of AI power than before actually. So before I come to my other question, Rajan, we also have a very steady flow of questions and I don't mean, I mean, want to miss that actually. And I just want to read one question which has actually two aspects and I am just reading because I don't want to lose the relevance. The question is about how does one engage customers toward AI initiatives given constraints on cost and ROI? And the linked one is what are the top three pointers on a successful consulting outcome in AI? Okay. Uh, yeah, on the first question, how do you engage? I mean, I'm assuming that uh, uh, this could be a question uh, for uh, a service provider in the AI analytics space. This could also be a question for an internal analytics team. I mean, meaning that most organizations have an analytics team and then they might be grappling, how do I convince my management or my leadership, right, in order to uh, spend money on certain initiatives? Uh, I think uh, the, the, the approach that I have seen work best uh, is one that involves uh, a very clear definition of a problem to begin with, okay, and 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 it's a fairly simple statement that I'm saying here. But the clear definition of the problem is often the most challenging aspect of it. The most challenging aspect because you need to define the problem comprehensively. You need to also understand who are all the different stakeholders and the parties that are impacted by the presence of that problem. You also need acknowledgement from all of those people that it is actually a problem because oftentimes may not even realize that there is a problem because they are uh, they are wedded to their current ways of decision making and thinking and processes and all that so much of the the work uh, with respect to any ai analytics initiative is really about defining the problem as clearly as possible getting all the constituents and the stakeholders to the table acknowledging the presence of the problem and quantifying the magnitude of the problem because the magnitude of the problem is also what tells you what is the price that you're after? What is the opportunity? You solve the problem, then that is really the price that is available for you, right? Uh, so uh, acknowledgement needs to be there of all of these things. Only if that is there, then you can move to the next step of, step of how do I solve the problem, right? Is uh, a, a very hard AI approach the right way or can this problem be just solved by presenting the data that we already have in some interesting manner? Right, using the so, right Raja, I'm just chiming in and you said a very right thing about the whole approach and uh, the full approach and I'll come back to you later to kind of just paraphrase again one of the questions which is also coming and the reason I chimed in was look AI as a constant has always been a peaceful approach by many of the clients is there a kind of a strategic view which tells that look can be pervasive, it can be embedded, and can have a far more holistic appeal as opposed to piecemeal. So would you like to comment in the concept of what you were saying, Raj? Absolutely, and, and I see examples of uh, organizations that adapt uh, that kind of uh, 
adopt that kind of an approach uh, uh, plentiful. I mean, even amongst the clients that we work with, uh, I'm not at liberty to reveal client names, uh, but we have been working with uh, uh, with one of the uh, leading players, right? In uh, in the uh, uh, in in the I mean the software, but uh, they have been reorienting their entire model over the last uh, five years uh, to adopt a, a very very data driven model uh, in terms of how to approach all of their processes and functions to the extent that their entire operating model, right, and how they look at the company is now fundamentally based on data, meaning that for any problem that you want to solve, for anything that you want to address, any restructuring, any changes to processes, it is all driven by, are we uh, putting out the problem correctly? Are we getting the data that we need to solve the problem? Are we analyzing the data in the correct way? Are we presenting the analysis in the right fashion? And then therefore, are we taking the right decision on the back of that analysis? So there are organizations that do uh, it completely in terms of running the entire business. At the other end, you also have uh, situations where I have a particular uh, issue, right? And I want to solve that. I mean, and, and to stay with uh, my favorite example of attrition, for example, I mean, I have an attrition problem and I need to solve attrition. So let me just build a model to understand attrition better and see whether I can influence attrition so that uh, 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 influence employee engagement so that I'm, I'm cutting down on attrition, right? So that could be a very point problem that you attack. I think both are fine. There is nothing wrong in adopting, uh, you know, in going for a, a very big, all pervasive strategic view. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in identifying a bunch of use cases, which are very specific, as long as you are very clear about the presence of the problem. Now to do this more thing, it calls for more maturity. It is not going to come about naturally, right? I mean, uh, there'll be questions on why are we going ahead and investing on a data platform, for example, that is going to aggregate all the data that is available in the company for me to be able to adopt that kind of strategic perspective, because you cannot do that uh, with having only piecemeal data and information. Now, like you pointed out, a piecemeal approach will help you to solve point problems, which, are, which might be very important in their own right, but it is a journey from there to getting to a strategic view and a perspective. And uh, many organizations that we talk to, what we find is they tend to start at the, the lower end of the spectrum, right? Where you're tackling specific use cases and problems, you build confidence in the approach and the methodology and, and you, you get buy-in. And then over a period of time, you migrate from solving problems to tackling a process, then from tackling a process to tackling a function, then from tackling a function to tackling you know, strategy, right? Uh, or, but isn't that, Rajan, to your point, this aspect could be more regressive. I use a more kind of a provocative word because we're talking about in the scenario where the deconstruction of value chains have happened already. You gave a right and very apt example about supply chains and the toilet paper analogy. And we're talking about a complete transformation of the businesses, the markets, and even the geographies. So over there, does the piecemeal approach works or what you are suggesting, look, I think that that kind of a scenario is over. Let's look at AI holistically and maybe as a part of the strategic element in the organization. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, uh, like I said earlier, uh, it's a hard call to make in these circumstances because everybody is hollering about what happens to me in this quarter and how do I preserve cash and how do I show some returns from the initiatives that I'm doing. Uh, but uh, that is really necessary though, right? In terms of that longer term perspective and the strategic perspective. And uh, if you do not uh, adopt that perspective, uh, certain companies and uh, even uh, current industry constructs might be in the danger of getting uh, uh, wiped out or becoming insignificant in the, in the scheme of things as we move to the new normal, because the new normal might be very, very different and might have very different kind of constructs uh, in comparison to what uh, companies might be experiencing today. I mean, so for example, uh, the restaurant business, right? Everybody talks about travel hospitality and restaurants are impacted big time, right? Uh, I was reading about uh, how Panera Bread uh, in the US has very quickly switched uh, to being able to share uh, menus and options and delivery and so on uh, very quickly that uh, they are adjusting uh, even in this current scenario. And the article went on to talk about how in future uh, going to a restaurant uh, itself might not be the experience that people crave, but instead the experience itself might morph into saying that we want to know how the food is prepared inside the restaurant. 
So we want to see videos of the chefs making the food. How are they inventing new things, right? That they put on uh, in in front of us on the table, right? Maybe so the safety component you talked about, the whole hygiene safety component may kind of kick in, right? right. Exactly. So 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 the experiences that customers and clients will look for itself could undergo a fundamental shift and therefore you cannot uh, 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 you cannot imagine those things by adopting a very incremental mindset right so it's like this if you're playing with a bunch of uh, lego pieces for example right and you're trying to assemble them if you do not have a concept of what you're trying to build right uh, whether you want to build a, an aircraft carrier or or a cargo plane, for example, or a, or, a, or a fighter jet, you are not going to uh, be uh, moving in that direction. I mean, you, you will assemble things, right? And you will create something, uh, but you are operating at a very component level. I mean, to adopt that strategic perspective means that you need to think about strategic options that might be available, and then you need to be able to look at data and analysis that can help analyze strategic options. It is not easy. Uh, it is necessary, though. I think the shift will take some time. I mean, I don't know whether, uh, and, and that is what the experience has been, right? In, in many uh, past economic shock scenarios, black swan events, right, as people talk about, uh, it, while conceptually it is easy to talk about this, saying that, that you need to have that foot in tomorrow and you need to adopt a strategic perspective. Most organizations, most people, they end up taking a very incremental approach. And in that incremental approach, sometimes they turn out lucky, some, sometimes they just stay neutral, but in many instances, uh, things might turn out very differently right, in comparison to what they set out to do. Uh, so therefore, building that perspective is important. It is worthwhile investing time to think about those kind of scenarios. Great. No, I think that's that's a great perspective. And uh, oh, man, I think uh, we've got series of questions, Raj, Rajan. Let me pick up you because uh, I think uh, some of them are really interesting. You talked about this fractal analogy, and I've heard about fractal a lot. So let me put a question around this. Uh, and I'll just read verbatim, Rajan. It's a very interesting question. Do you think the AI technologies are up to speed to derive insights from the orthogonal variables you spoke about? When more and more variables come in, there is no unification of that data, which is true. Is the industry moving towards unification without much data loss? I think it's a great question. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it is not. Uh, uh, it's not an easy question, though, right? Uh, one way it manifests itself uh, is uh, all the black box approaches that you see emerging when it comes to uh, neural networks and uh, AI technology. Everybody today talks about GANs and uh, uh, deep learning, right? And those kind of models which are being used in AI, where uh, uh, you know about the inputs that you are giving and you know about the outputs that you are getting, but you really don't know what is going on in the box, right? Uh, and, and that is scary because uh, uh, you are worried about what kind of things are really being taken into consideration. And then you have seen some examples play out, right? I mean, everyone has heard about the Amazon experience uh, with their interviewing process and then how sudden biases got inter introduced because of just looking at right. and then picking up signals from the data. We have done our share of uh, projects where we have processed uh, large data sets. Uh, there is a, there's a piece of work that we have done for one of the leading uh, automobile manufacturers uh, in Europe. And uh, they just gave a, a dump of all the IoT sensor data that was coming from all their vehicles. And uh, they didn't give us any a priori hypothesis at all. I mean, there's a piece of work that we did on some a priori hypothesis as well, right, to test and validate certain things. But more importantly, they gave a bunch of data and then said that you come up with patterns, right? You see what patterns are there and what cohorts are there and what behavioral patterns are emerging from that. And it actually threw up a bunch of things, right? Which nobody contemplated or thought about, or there was no preconceived notion going into that data, but the data has nuances and patterns and those things emerge, right? Uh, and that is why I gave that fractal analogy earlier, because when you go deeper and deeper into a fractal, you will see more and more beautiful patterns. And you'll also be able to connect the patterns at the lower level with the patterns that, that you see at the macro level, right? Uh, I, I think it is uh, it is important to uh, have that open-minded, uh, what I call as a database approach, okay? Uh, the other approach being a hypothesis-based approach. If you have a hypothesis-based approach, you're putting down very clearly that these are the five hypotheses and 10 things that I want to test. And therefore, I go looking for data to test those hypotheses. There is a database approach you don't have any preconceived notion. You're going to generate the hypothesis on the basis of what data is available, right? And whether figuring out 
whether they are orthogonal, whether they add value, whether you're able to interpret them, not to mention the numerous uh, feature engineering stuff that can be done on top of it. There are techniques that are emerging where you can resolve completely uh, mathematical constructs uh, into known orthogonal dimensions, right? Meaning that there might be a bunch of things that, that is there in, inside the model, but you could actually use, uh, I don't know, people are familiar with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and so on. I mean, uh, you will know if part of the math that you've done in engineering college or elsewhere, that there are ways by which you can resolve uh, unknown dimensions into known dimensions, right? By uh, reflecting them on those dimensions. So there are techniques that uh, people are working on, uh, but it is early stages. So today you will therefore want to classify problems. Is this a problem where accuracy is more important for me? The prediction is more important for me. And I don't really care about how I get to that accuracy and prediction in which case I'm willing to live with some amount of data black hole, right? Meaning I put it in and I don't care too much about the processing, but it's giving me a very good prediction. And this prediction I can work with, but there'll be other instances where you want to know how you arrived at the prediction. So for example, this attrition modeling, if I don't know why the model is telling me that this person is going to add right, then I can do nothing about it. Because the I'm building the model is to prevent attrition. And I can prevent attrition only if I know what is causing attrition. And I need to delve and understand the model, right? But there'll be situations which are amenable to that approach as well as this approach. Uh, we need to look at it uh, uh, you know, on a case by case basis, what will take. I'm sure that uh, more and more research is being done on converting black boxes into, you know, into glass boxes as well. Right, that we understand what is going on. Uh, that's work in progress, though, and, and then we'll get there. Wonderful. Rajan, last question. And I know we I could have actually done this session again, but because of the I would say time we have a constraint. This is a brass stack kind of a question. Uh, the question is simple that look, I want to implement AI in my organization. Where do you think I need to start and what should be my first step? Uh, I, I would uh, uh, I would recommend uh, to start uh, at both ends of the spectrum. Okay, meaning that if this is a company that hasn't done uh, much by way of uh, AI or even analytics initiatives, I would recommend a two pronged approach. One is to take one or two use cases which are very well defined, well known problems. This is at one end of the spectrum, and, and the reason I advocate this is because it is important for you to build faith in AI. It is important for you to build faith in the process and the approach that one uses in order to uh, make uh, use of the power of data and analytics. Right? People, uh, people don't readily accept it, right? I mean, uh, I have seen the greatest amount of resistance come from uh, the most uh, 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 learned or uh, uh, engineered of places, okay, in some sense, because and the more you believe that you know the greater the resistance right to new things so i think it is important to also have that focus at that end of the spectrum but sure with that also take a look at the big picture right try to look at what are we trying to do as a company uh, what is it uh, what is the goal that we are after what are we trying to transform right for example some companies might come up with uh, an answer that we are trying to transform a customer experience in our industry another company might come up with a idea that we want to be able to offer the cheapest uh, 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 product or service right in the space. Another might say that I want to actually promise uh, uh, a really fast turnaround and availability of uh, anything that the customer would be looking for, right? Uh, in, in a very fast, uh, transparent fashion. So put down one or two things that are the most important strategic objectives for the company, and then take a look at today for me to get to that strategic objective. What is the data that I use to make decisions related to that? How do I, what are the processes that are there in the company that helps me make that kind of a, you know, take that kind of a decision? And are there opportunities for me to bring in more data to clarify the decision-making process and take the right kind of cost, right? Uh, it is important to do that exercise as well because uh, you then start building a bigger strategic perspective about what is it that you're trying to accomplish in the company. It's a very clarifying process for most organizations as well. You know, when you really sit down and think about uh, how do you, uh, really make the most important decisions that matter for the company uh, and how much of data is really being used to make those uh, uh, those plays. Uh, you will actually be surprised. Many organizations will be surprised that uh, when it eventually reaches the higher e echelons of management and the strategic, that, that stratosphere, much of the decision-making is done on the basis of uh, 
philosophy, gut feel, thinking, right? Politics, right? I mean, all of those things will be playing out, right? So therefore it is important uh, for organizations to take a look at that as well. If you're able to marry these two and then create uh, some uh, initiatives that are able to tackle both ends of the, the, the spectrum, I think it's a great beginning. If you're not able to do the strategy, at least start at the, at the other end of the spectrum. I mean, find a few problems and then define the problem statement. I mean, there is a approach uh, you know, that I outlined earlier get the right stakeholders into the team, define the problem, agree on what the problem situation is, and then see what changes you need to make to the process on the back, back of data and analytics. Now that's about. Awesome. Rajan, must say, I think uh, personally, I have enjoyed this session because I think one thing, if I just paraphrase, and it's an underpinning coming from your session that, look, one thing is pretty obvious. AI is not at the cusp, it's already embedded in the strategy and the businesses of the organization. I think the whole analogy of the mining industry, and I'm getting a lot of comments and very positive kind of, let's say, feedback about what you talked about, the fractal thing you talked about. I think, and that's where I think this whole facet of what you rightly said, look, the problem sol solving through AI could be actually used in terms of a scenario where it, it's not only in conjunction with using mathematics or let's say operational research. It could also be a feature of using a lot of business nuances, subtleties around, let's say, looking at how do you want to look at problem solving scenario and also ensuring stakeholders are rightfully, I mean, I would say aware of this entire situation. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate and uh, would be, I mean, great to have one more session because I'm sure we could cover many of the questions which are flowing in like seamless to me and uh, pleasure having you on this second session, Rajan. Thank you so much. Thanks all the participants. Likewise, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Samir, and uh, thank you, uh, AI QRA team. Uh, it's great uh, joining you on this webinar. Look forward to future interactions. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.